We're in Revelation chapter 3 this morning. I hope that you'll open up your Bibles there to Revelation chapter 3. And we're studying this letter that the Lord writes to the church in Sardis. The city of Sardis is not really one that we pay much attention to these days. It is not a famous name. It is not a place that a lot of cities afterward have been named after. You, you think of maybe Philadelphia or Ephesus or Corinth. You go to many different states in our nation and you'll see places that have those names. They're kind of maybe modeling themselves after those great cities of ancient times. Sardis is not really one of those. But it was deemed to have been one of the great cities of antiquity for a time. It was very wealthy. Uh, we've looked at some places, I guess, uh, last week we were looking at the church in Thyatira, a city that became very wealthy through a lot of, a lot of trade, a lot of industry that took place there. Uh, really, Sardis, in some ways, became wealthy the old-fashioned way. They walked out into the rivers that were running nearby the city and found them laden with gold and silver and electrum, kind of a, a mixture, an amalgam of gold and silver, and found that their, uh, their natural resources were, were very rich in things that men valued. And so they were able to leverage that to great financial success early in the run of the city. It's thought, in fact, that coin currency, the money itself, originated in Sardis, that they might have been the first ones to put that idea to use. The city was on three sides, surrounded by or, or built up upon nearly perpendicular heights, uh, cliffs that were 1,500 feet or more high that made the city almost unassailable from those three directions and therefore rather easily defended by its men who could be positioned in the only place that you could attack it from. It had a bit of a reputation for invincibility. But by this time that John is writing to them, that name Sardis had lost a lot of its luster. The city had been conquered a couple of times in the last few hundred years. There had, in the year 17 AD, been an, an earthquake, a great earthquake that had devastated several of these cities, in fact. But Sardis, it seems, had borne a, a particularly harsh uh, burden because of that. Tacitus mentions no one had greater pity as a result of that earthquake than the people of Sardis. It had really racked them. The city itself, then, we see as kind of one that had a name in those days, a name that rang out and had some weight attached to it, had an image that maybe would come to mind when you thought of Sardis, of wealth and power and prestige and strength. But that city was on the decline. In similar fashion, we see the church in Sardis mirroring that state. They had a name. There was a reputation there. There was something that people had heard of, and they maybe used to have a well-deserved reputation for vitality, and usefulness, and strength in God's kingdom, and yet they too were on the decline. I want to consider together this morning the question of why. Why do churches die? In Sardis, that is the danger I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. How did this happen? How did we reach this point in Sardis? I will mention from the beginning, this will not in any way be an exhaustive treatment of the subject of why churches die. That is a useful subject to investigate so that history does not repeat itself with us, in undue time at least. But from this letter we do gain several insights into why the church in Sardis was, if not dead already, very near the brink. There is hope for them, of course, as the Lord spells out. But they were in danger of blinking out of existence. We hear of that happening from time to time, don't we? An acquaintance that you have that maybe when you knew them years ago, you, you worshipped with a certain group together. And you've both since moved away. Maybe you ask them, well, I haven't, I haven't been back to that town in, in 20 years. How, how are they doing there, that, that group that we used to worship with? What are they up to? And the answer comes back, they're not up to anything. The church isn't there anymore. There, there's the, the, that, that group no longer exists. 
Often after a long, slow process of dying off, we might see those churches simply cease to be. Or on an individual level, a personal level, we contact those who we learn after have maybe been spiritually dead for a long time. They simply had the appearance of life. They've been going through all the motions. They've been putting on a facade of vitality. But beneath that, there is no real life, the the walking dead in a spiritual sense. How does this happen? How can we guard against it? That's what I want to give our time this morning in investigating. The first thing that I see from this church is really a failure to realize, a failure to recognize the very real possibility of that happening. And, And in their case, As we've said, it was not a possibility, it was fact, it was what was actually happening among this church there. And so the Lord must tell them in verse 2, be watchful. Some of your translations might say there, uh, wake up, or something along those lines, which I guess has the same thrust, it has the same end result, but that be watchful seems to be closest to the, the actual words that are put in use there and to what John is actually saying, or the Spirit through John. Be watchful. Pay attention to what you are doing, and strengthen the things which remain. As we said at the beginning, the city of Sardis was for years, really for for centuries, thought to be almost impregnable. There was an idiom of the time. If you were doing an impossible task, or, or you were setting off on really just... What would be deemed a fool's errand? You, you were going to, tr- to try to do something that was just impossible, and you'd be better off not wasting your time even attempting it. There was a phrase that it would be easier to take the Acropolis of Sardis than to do such and such, whatever it might be. It was kind of a colloquialism that they had in the day. It was just a, an impossible thing to do. But in four, uh, excuse me, 549, Cyrus of Persia, was at war against the the Lydian kingdom. And thinking it impossible, as as one would, seeing those those huge cliffs on three sides of the city, thinking it impossible to to scale those, you know, get out the grappling hooks or do whatever you can to go up uh, 1,500 feet up those mountainsides, uh, seeing that the, the defenses mustered on the other side of the city just... That, that would not work either. A frontal assault is going to be suicide. For a good while, he was at a loss. The story goes, this is most likely legend, but who knows? Maybe there was some grain of truth at the beginning of this story, at least. But the story says that one day, a Persian soldier was out on one of those cliff sides, and he dropped his helmet down the mountainside. Just was not paying attention, dropped his helmet. And one of Cyrus's soldiers watched him very gingerly, very slowly work his way down a winding path that led through what seemed to be an unscalable cliff, but almost like a young mountain goat. This man picked his way delicately through the rocks and the shrubs and made his way down to where his helmet was and then just as slowly and carefully went back up. That night, After the man told Cyrus what he had observed that night, Cyrus sent his men up that winding, steep, precipitous pathway. And as they reached the summit of that trail, they found nothing waiting for them. No defenders, no soldiers, no enemies anywhere to be seen, just a free entrance into the city. And so they took the place that very night. The idea is a simple one. If you are not watchful, if you are not careful, if you have that attitude, we've got walls on every side, why be vigilant? Why pay attention? No one could attack us here. No one could find a weakness or a vulnerability here. Churches can fail to recognize the dangers that they face. We can fail to perceive the fact that there might even be any danger whatsoever. We're the church of the Lord. We've got the gospel. We have good leaders. We have a lot of good people here. Everyone seems to like each other. We've been so strong in the past. All of these things that we might muster, that we build up as a case for saying, we have nothing to worry about. That that other churches die. 
We don't die, at least not in my lifetime. That's not going to happen. That's for someone else to have to deal with. What would possibly happen that could cut us off from God? And Sardis, it was a real threat. In fact, a certainty if they did not change soon. But it all begins with apparently the fact that they had not been watchful. They had not been paying attention. They had fallen asleep on duty. We cannot do the same thing. If we hope to survive, if we hope to continue living, be aware of the possibility of fall. Be aware of the possibility that if we do not maintain our strength and do not take the positive, proactive steps forward to see that we survive and thrive, we might meet a similar end. We also see the Lord chastising them for, in a sense, not finishing what they had started. He says there in verse number 2 that he has not found their works perfect before God. Often when you find the idea of perfection in Scripture, it has the idea of completion in biblical use. When you talk about a man who wants to, to perfect himself or a man who wants to become perfect, you understand we're not speaking in the sense of, I am without flaw. I am not ever going to make a mistake if I become a perfect man. We're instead looking at someone who has become complete. He has shored up all of his defenses. He has seen to all of these different areas of need and is trying to complete his character and become perfect in that way. When we think of that when that which is perfect has come, it has that meaning, that idea behind it. When that which is complete, when the full picture has arrived. We don't have a whole lot of information about the church in Sardis, historical information, uh, how it began, what, what things were like at the beginning, who, who started it, who planted that church, so to speak. But apparently they had started well. Really, more often than not, most churches in those days did because it was a trying time. It was not easy to be a Christian. And so if, if you were in a church anywhere, you were alongside people, arm in arm with those who had zeal and courage and faith and were willing to, to fight hard for what they believed in and fight hard for the cause of Christ and wanted to attract others to that cause and were diligent in that business. There simply were too many factors working against them to survive more than a week if there were not people who had those attitudes going into things. But at some point, they had stopped. At some point, they had decided that where they were then was just going to have to be good enough. So he says, your works are not perfect before God. Your works are not complete before God. You've just kind of left off halfway through. There is a tremendous need. And if we, if we untethered ourselves from Revelation 3 and, and looked throughout the entire scripture, we, we could be here for, for hours looking at the need repeatedly stressed throughout God's counsel to abound, to add on, to increase, to grow, to supply what is lacking, to grow up, to build up. There will always be a tremendous need for growth. We find ourselves with the attitude sometimes, well, that's, we've got that part done. We've grown. We went through a period of growth. We kind of sustained that for a little while, solidified what we had. We've grown. We can now move on to something else. We'll, we'll look into other things. There's nothing else to move on to. We must always be growing. That is the need ever before us. What did you set out to do when you decided to follow the Lord? Did you have a, a picture in your mind of what a Christian looked like? And even still, do you kind of have that ideal in mind? Like the ideas that, that Paul sets forth. 1 Corinthians, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Or he tells the Philippians, you've got us as a pattern, that you can walk in that pattern. Did you have kind of an image of, this is, this is the, the saint, the, the godly person, the disciple that I want to, to grow into. Here I am starting out, but maybe you had that, that father figure, a, a father in the faith that you looked at and you saw, I want to be strong on my feet. I want to, to take a stand for those things which are good and right. And I want to 
be a, a man who shepherds his family closely. And I want to be a man who is, is patient in all things. You just you can't reach the end of my fuse. I'm long-suffering, even though all these things might work against me. I'm going to maintain my composure and continue to show Christ to those that I come into contact with. I'm going to have integrity and always speak the truth and never go beyond that. People can, can count on me. And I'm going to be of great service to anyone that I come into contact with. The guy who's bringing the meal, riding the car, making the call, bringing in the moving truck, doing whatever it is, I'm going to be that guy every time. And those are the things that I want to do. And I want to have this, this encompassing knowledge of Scripture so that if anyone came to me with any issue, I would be able to patiently and lovingly show them the truth and guide them into what they need to understand and help them along that way so that I can help all of us to understand the Lord better and to see the mind of God and see those things that He has put in, in front of us that we can grasp. I want to help others see that great light and be able to point them towards that. We have this, this image of who I want to grow into, this, this shining example, not for our own pride, not for our own glory, but because we, we love God and we want to become our very best and we want to meet that, that standard that we set and meet that standard that God sets and in some way kind of grow into those footprints. If you had that image in your mind, Ask yourself now then, have you, have you grown into your full potential as a Christian? And I'm not asking that necessarily as a facetious question. That's not a preacher gotcha question. I, I think I know the answer for most of us, if not all of us, but really ask yourself, have I grown into my full potential as a servant of God? Have I just really reached the, the maximum level there? We hit that point with a lot of other things. I, I probably had my athletic prime in seventh grade, probably, relative to my peers at least. Seventh grade, I, I, we had gone the entire season in football without giving up a point. Nobody had scored a point on us on my seventh grade team. And the other team had driven down. They were on like the 10, 15-yard line. It was fourth down, and I went in and sacked the quarterback and hit him so hard that he blew snot all over my helmet. And that was... That was the greatest athletic moment of my life up to that point, and I don't think I passed it. I don't think I ever did anything that great again. That was the peak. They're you know, 12 years old or however old you were. Academically, you might say, boy, I, when you look at a math problem or you look at something, you say, I, I would have been able to tell you how to do that when I was a junior in high school, but I've, I've forgotten. I've lost a lot of that knowledge. We might reach that peak in our mental capabilities or our knowledge of science or whatever it might be, our physical prowess, you're going to reach that peak. Have you reached that point spiritually where you say, I used to be stronger, I used to have a greater love for God, I used to have a greater grounding in the Scripture, but those times are just kind of past, and, and here I am now just sort of going along. I've, I've crested and I've peaked, and now I'm just kind of enjoying the downslope in my sunset years. I think that's really the picture that our God has for us. A God who spends so much time saying, increase and abound, excel still more. I continue to press on. He wants those who continue working. When you set out to follow the Lord, who did you want to be? And are you that person? Or is there still work to do? I know where I am in that spectrum. Well, look at the church. Has this church finished its work? Mission accomplished? We did it? I don't, I'm glad I don't see anyone jumping up and saying, yes, we've done it. Let's all go home and, and quit because we've done what the Woodland Hills Church was supposed to do. I realize this, this point that I have on the screen. They don't finish what they start. That's a bit of a misnomer because of what we're talking about. We, we can't finish what we start. We can certainly quit. You can stop, but we can't ever really finish. The key is going to be to continue to work. Their works were not perfect. Their works were not complete before God. They were, they were coasting on reputation, but not really living. They needed to get back to work. And so that's his counsel in verse 3. Remember, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard Hold fast and repent. That hold fast, your translation might say, keep it. 
Keep it and repent. Go back to what you knew to do. Churches and people are often counseled by God to remember. If it takes going back to those basics and reminding yourself of what your mission is, do it. But get back to work. Finish what you have begun. He who has begun a good work in you wants to see that finished. Let's also notice from this group that they seem to have resisted the influence of godly members among them. The letter receives, well, the church, rather, receives communication as a whole. The letter goes to all of them, as it does in each of these seven. We've pointed that out a couple of times already, that there is an interesting dynamic there where you have a letter written to a church and and kind of characterizing them all the same way. But we realize if, if a letter were written to all of us as a group, that might apply differently in different ways to each one of us because we're all different people who are doing different things and are in various states of obedience or disobedience to God and at various points of strength and capability in our faith and all those sorts of things. So like all churches in Sardis, they're comprised of individuals. And some of those people that they had there, although he would have to say to the church as a whole, you're, you're dead, you've got a name for being vibrant and alive, but you're actually dead. But some people there were vital and godly and good. He says there in verse 4, you have a few names there who are, who are worthy. You have a few names that have not defiled themselves. In verse 2, when he refers to strengthening what remains, the things which remain. That that could be referring to people as well, not just the the works that they were doing, but maybe those individuals themselves strengthen those things which remain alive. Those who are barely hanging on because they're fighting this overwhelming spiritual war with no support. Can we picture some of the members in Sardis saying to themselves, maybe looking at some of those who are worthy, and saying, why, why are they spending so much time worrying about blank? Why would anyone make a, a fuss about blank? Whatever the issue might be that they didn't think was important, that these godly members were, were harping on. Or some crusade that one of their brethren had taken on there to, to truly do good, to truly see the will of Christ active in the world, and they just look at this guy and say, won't he knock it off already? He's, he's making the rest of us look bad. Or what a, what a goody two-shoes he's being. He's always calling me, trying to get me involved in this, and I don't have the time for that. I wish he would just sort of cool down. There's a tendency among some to see godliness or attentiveness and concern in others as excessive or maybe the, the active work and service and love of those pillars in the church is taken for granted. Rather than inspiring me to be like that person, it's very easy for me to just take on the attitude that, well, he'll keep doing that, won't he? And so any of the needs that we have in the church are just going to be met by this guy. Well, I don't need to do this because sister so-and-so will handle that. I don't really need to try to serve in this way or try to increase my capabilities in this regard because, well, we've got people that do that already. Someone else will handle it. Someone else will look after it. Someone else will steer things. And somebody else surely has their hand on the wheel. They can, they can teach my children. They can strengthen those who are, are fainting and need encouragement. They can do all those things that I really just shouldn't have to be bothered to do. Where there are a a few, as he describes it here, where there are a few shining lights in the midst of a dying husk of a church, there exists a greater collective that is wasting that good influence. A a collective that, quite honestly, is, is not worthy of that good influence that is among them. They're spoiling it. All of that zeal, all of that knowledge, all those, those useful things that could be shared aren't being taken advantage of. What we must do, on the other hand, is find those members who excel. Find those strong things that remain. Find those who are worthy and follow them. Get on the same page with them. 
do what they're doing. Have them take you under their wings. Say, teach me what you're doing so that I can do it as well. Find those who are vital and useful in their faith and walk after them. Strengthen what remains. Don't resist it. Don't cast dispersions on it. Don't turn your nose up at it. Follow it. Final point I want to observe this morning is ultimately we see that this this judgment will come. This church was in danger of dying because of God's judgment against it. He apparently found them unprofitable, unfit for his kingdom. And that was the true threat. There's an emphasis throughout this letter on the name. You see that word name occurring four times here in just this short, you know, six verses, short little paragraph. But he talks repeatedly about the name. The church, for instance, he says, had a name or a reputation that they were alive. This, to me, is the hardest element of the whole thing to truly process, but maybe the most necessary. Sardis was seen as a good church. In the first century, the people around them, in neighboring cities, people who came through Sardis, people who were invested in what saints were doing, who had their finger on the pulse of the brotherhood, when they would think of Sardis, they would think of a bastion of faith. That's a place where strength dwells. That's a place where things are happening. They're they're doing good work there in Sardis. I can easily picture the other places that would read this letter. It seems the Spirit wanted these letters all to go to each other. It ends up being sent along that postal route throughout Asia. They're all going to see what the Lord is saying to each other. I can easily see the people in Philadelphia or Ephesus or elsewhere reading this and saying, "Is Is that right? He said, Sardis? Is the dead one? Check the name again. You might have read that wrong. It would be a public reading most of the time instead of me sitting down and reading it myself. Talk to the guy afterward, because I don't think he said, he, he shouldn't have said Sardis there. He was talking about somebody else. They're solid. They're good. They're sound. But what man sees and what God sees seldom line up. And that difficulty often extends to the church. Our estimation of ourselves. Our estimation of what he truly wants from us. The fact is, God sees a good name. But he is not pleased with their work. He is not pleased whatsoever. With these people that everyone else was very, they were very impressed with. In fact, shockingly, as it always is, it is God himself who will be the final cause of their downfall if they do not repent. He says in verse 3, I will come upon you as a thief. That that cold reality, I mean, even takes away the dimension of, you know, using an agent to to do this, using some kind of a, of an outside, you know, outsourcing the work in some way. I don't know what means God would use to judge them, and it does seem that he's looking at a near-term physical judgment against this church in some way, but he doesn't even couch that in any language that says, I will send someone else to do it. I will come upon you as a thief. By the same token, if they made good on their initial promise that they'd shown, if they turned things around, it would be through the power that God supplied. We have to recognize that too. The promises that he makes to those who would overcome in verse 5, those who, who... who did what the Lord wanted. They include a supernatural element. He he mentions there the idea that I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels, something beyond what man could accomplish. Christ would confess their names before his father and his angels. Remember that those are not necessarily after-death promises that he makes to the overcomers. Those are simply things that are granted to the faithful. So he is saying to them, essentially, if you want my help, If you come to me for help, if you have uh, any inkling that you wish to overcome, it's there. It's available. My Father will help. His angels will help. He will hear your name and send His aid. The image on both sides of the equation becomes one 
that they would stand or fall because God would secure one of those ends for them based on their response to his counsel. So why do churches die? Why do churches survive? Because God deems them fit or not and might be the one who decides the life span of that church. There is a tendency to think that our most meager and disinterested efforts will be accepted by God. That whatever we give, so long as we keep sleepily shuffling along in generally the right direction, and as long as we don't fall into outright apostasy, that's good enough for the Lord. Please be very clear. I am not talking about, I can only provide this so much because I am only gifted so much. Or I am only able to provide so much because my health only allows this much, or whatever concern, real concern there might be that impacts what we are able to do or what service we can provide to God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the idea that says, whatever I feel like doing, God will just have to take it and be pleased. That's not the case in Sardis, was it? The Lord says to a group of people who, whose works were incomplete, who actually were dead, whether they knew it or not, who were coasting on reputation, who were cooling off and beginning to die where they should be growing, he says, enough. I'm coming for you. You don't need to continue doing this because, quite honestly, there's not a whole lot of reason for you to continue doing this. That which doesn't abide, that which doesn't grow, will be cut off, will be thrown in the fire. That's really ultimately the only thing it is useful for. Judgment is real. It takes a variety of forms. So, what does he really see when he sees us? What does he really see when he sees me? We might have a name. We might have a reputation. We might have this outward facade that says, good active, zealous. Is that what God sees? Is that what the works actually show? Or is it a case of what we have in Sardis? Death walking. A name, an appearance of vitality, but no life underlying it. As we finish, remember, these letters were written to churches comprised of individuals. And so, it does have some usefulness to ask ourselves, is the Woodland Hills Church in danger of dying? Are we guarding against that? Are we taking proactive steps to ensure that we do not? But also remember to ask yourself, am I in danger of dying? Am I under this threat? That's the most immediate question now, one that has to be directed inward. An illustration I see commonly when this church is being discussed, and I think it's, I think it's a good illustration to use, is the evening sky. You look out into the stars. I've always, always liked space, stars, planets. One of the things went through a phase when I was young, wanted to be an astronaut. That was probably... Before my uh, seventh grade exploits, you know, before I had reached my athletic peak, I thought I'll be, a, I'll be an astronaut. Always fascinated by how many things there are out there, how, how huge they are. If you look at the sizes of some of the stars that are outside of our galaxy even, they just dwarf our sun. They make our sun look like what our moon looks like next to our sun. They're just these enormous things. We get some appreciation for the, the scale of all those things by one of the terms that we use to refer to distances on that galactic and intergalactic level. You'll hear about something that is a thousand light years away. And that's just referring to, roughly speaking, I guess, how far light can travel in one year is a light year. You hear about a place that is 30,000 light years away. 
What's that really telling us when we look out into the stars and we see something that might be 30,000 light years away? That tells us that if that star went supernova and boom, it's gone. That star is no more. We're not going to see it here for another 30,000 years if this world is still standing at that point. What we're looking at when we see the night sky isn't what is really out there right now anymore. It's what used to be. It's still giving off light. It's still visible. still looks like a star and a constellation and a planet and whatever else it might be. But they might just not be there anymore. That is the threat. That is the danger with the soul that is not attentive to God, that is not diligent in things of Christ, that is not holding to our faith, that isn't holding fast to our God. That I might be putting off light, so to speak, might be visible in the night sky, but I might have ceased to be a long time ago. Make sure this morning that that is not you. Our God gives life. He is the source of life. If we wish to avoid death, it will only be found in Him. And so we make that appeal to you this morning, to come to Jesus for life, to come to Him for full salvation. If there is anything that we can offer by way of our services, in praying with you and assisting you in obeying his gospel, coming to him through the means that he, he has prescribed and that we seek to follow. We can help you if you wish. Come forward while we stand and sing this song.